Well, welcome everybody to this interview, this Green Room interview. My name is Nelson Cowan, and I serve as the director of the Center for Worship and the Arts here at Samford University in Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, the Center for Worship and the Arts is an organization of Samford um, with a mission of equipping congregations to engage intergenerational artistic worship practices that glorify God, honor Christ, and join the Spirit's transformative work in the world. This interview we're doing today with um, our guest, Aaron Shaw, is a part of our Green Room series, which is a collection of behind-the-scenes interviews about topics relevant to worship and the arts. So today, as I mentioned already, I'm joined by artist, professor, comedian, sort of, yeah, comedian, yeah, in my own mind. nail polish extraordinaire, <laughs> uh, Aaron Shaw. Um, but on, on a more serious note, because I do like to read her bio, um, and we would all like to hear her bio as well. Erin Shaw is a, a painter of Borderlands, The Spaces Between Worlds. As a visual storyteller, the child of an Oklahoma farm, Shaw tills the rich soil of dichotomy through her masterful uses of color, iconography, and story. As a Chickasaw Choctaw artist, she creates in a state of tension, suspended between two worlds where both solemnity and humor pervade her art. She finds that truths are revealed in unanticipated ways, and Trickster often appears throughout her work. Erin earned her BFA in studio art from Baylor University and her MFA from the University of Oklahoma. She is assistant professor of visual arts at John Brown University in Siloam. Is it Siloam Springs? S Siloam. Oh, so close. Siloam <laughs> Springs, Arkansas. Uh, an international speaker and a featured artist in Visual Voices, Contemporary Chickasaw Art, among other exhibits in the U.S. So, Erin, thanks again for being with us here today. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It's been a delight so far. Yeah. Uh, so tell us a little bit just about your journey in becoming a visual artist. We'll just start softball okay. level, and then I've got the really deep-hitting questions after this. Oh, good, this. good. I'll anticipate that. Yeah. Um, well, I was not a child who grew up thinking I would be an artist. Hmm. I was always embodying my creativity and expressing my creativity, but not in any kind of technical art form necessarily. So when I was um, an undergrad at Baylor, I had some friends that sort of pushed me over into the art department. Mm. And I took one class. I actually changed my major as a junior. Um, and so took one class and realized that there's a lot that goes into being an artist that sort of pulled on some of my different capacities or ways of being in the world that was real surprising, that it wasn't just a technical skill, although the technical skill is important. Yeah. Uh, so that's kind of how I stepped into it um, and then uh, went into a career of education straight out of undergrad. And so I've got about 25 years of education under my belt at this point, which kind of seems shocking. What did you What did you teach? Were you in, were you in like K through 12 education? I taught initially? in every type of context. Okay. So uh, I started middle school uh, First Baptist Academy in Houston, Texas. That was okay. my first ever teaching job. And then I moved to a Title I inner city school, also middle school, which I think probably sealed the deal for me as an educator. Then I moved to high school and now I'm in higher ed. So, okay. Wow. Yep. Yeah. Huh. So now for the deep hitting question. Oh, good. Okay. Um, so there's a couple of themes I'm, I'm hoping we can address. And okay. a lot of the folks who are going to be viewing this video have um, been introduced to your work, at least via your website, through some of our promotions. And um, so a couple of themes I'm hoping we can address. So two of them, Borderlands okay. and Story. Okay. So first up, Borderlands. And this is kind of a, for, for what I'm intuiting, a recurring theme mm -hmm. throughout your work. And mm -hmm. You know, it's fitting because right now um, the land we're situated on here at Samford University is itself a borderland. Um, we're on land that belongs to the Muscogee Creek Nation, uh, also coming up against the southern border of the Shawnee tribe. Mm. And as we're also uh, filming this, we're on a couple of other uh, borders. So like you mentioned actually earlier today in your presentation, a kind of a weather border we're experiencing Absolutely. right now where yeah. dead things are coming to life. Mm -hmm. and. 
Of course, in the the Christian year, the life of the liturgical year, we're in this kind of borderland experience of Holy Week, Mm -hmm. in this tension between Palm Sunday and Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, Holy Saturday, Mm -hmm. and Easter Sunday. And so I'd love to hear a little bit about this concept of borderlands and how it figures into your work and your identity. Absolutely. That's a great question. Yeah, I I talk a lot about, um, I think when I first started sort of articulating that, the borderlands, it was it was through my work of looking at stories and particularly the trickster, a character that, which happens to be the most widely written about character in all of narrative theory. Mm-hmm. So of course, you know, what am I, what am I really going to get figured out about the trickster? But the trickster would be a character that would always kind of live in these threshold places in the liminal space, when at doorways. And I was really interested in the trickster because there was always deep change that was possible within those spaces when you're moving from one space into another space or when you're in the Mm in-between. And so theoretically I found it interesting, but then also as it related to my life personally, um, not always really knowing how to function in those places. Like when something has ended and something hasn't begun yet, it's a really rich place for deep transformation, but you can also sort of get um, anxious in that space as well. And so I think the work has always, as an artist, has always sort of helped me process what's happening personally as well. And, but the trickster is, he's, he, she has been a character that I've always been really interested in. Hmm. How has that shown up, like visually, what does that, Look like look like in some of your some of your work. Yeah, so um, for a long time, the trickster would be uh, maybe different birds. Um, the raven is a trickster in certain indigenous histories. When I started narrowing in more on Chickasaw stories, um, one of the, the the tricksters that I found was the rabbit, and so um, I I paint I paint those. I don't really paint people. I paint a lot of stories and I use a lot of uh, birds. I use a lot of animals. I use a lot of like natural imagery within the story. And um, I I have one particular painting that comes to mind of a bird that has sort of been like, his face has kind of been like cut down, cut down the middle and it's sort of rolled back like Mm -hmm. a, like a tarp or something that uh, over a window and it's sort of rolled back in this chalkboard paint underneath it. And, my son Samuel drew a a rabbit um, and sort of the idea of like even using the idea of the of the trickster as tricking you even in who it is. Mm-hmm. Uh, but those I think they they show up a lot a lot in a lot of different um, iterations of paintings. And the other the other piece is about you know the theme of the story. Um, and something I read, I can't remember, I don't think this was in your bio, and another piece I read about you. I was just doing internet research all day That's before That's this. Good. It was great. That's good. Um, you describe yourself as one who creates paintings engaged in story, mm-hmm. and that you function as both a, uh, I love this language here, I want to hear more about this. You function as both a mediator and a disruptor mm-hmm. of story. Can you just... Those are some. Those are some fun words. Oh, and, they are fun words. You're and, right. And Did I say that? Are you sure you, I said that? You said that? it. It's okay. there. Right. Yeah. I so tell us. So, you yeah. said it. So you have to just explain it to us. Well, I find stories to be this like un. There's no. There's going to be no end to what I can mine out of stories. My own stories, personal history, sacred narratives, cultural stories stories across the world and this idea that stories are in a world that becomes, you know, more polarized and, and in a world that is rapidly changing, I think there's some sort of part of me as an artist that's looking for those things that are always um, going to sustain us and connect us. And I feel like stories are, are that one of those things, you know, we're all, I can use every metaphor. We're all swimming in a sea of stories. <laughs> like stories are our coin and our currency. It's the way that we are, we make meaning as human beings in the world and stories will always serve us. And so on one hand, there's a part of me that's that wants to hold on to the stories that have served me. But there's another part of me that is like, we need new stories. Hmm. And 
Um, and so I think that mediator and disruptor, I'm, I often will say that I, I'm taking stories and I'm taking them apart, like a, mm-hmm. a story that we may know, and then I'm trying to put it back together in an unusual way. And I think maybe that's the mediator and disruptor. Obviously, taking a story and pulling it apart is disruptive. Yeah. Um, and looking m- more concretely, more intentionally at what this story is and why it has served us and what perhaps, like I believe about stories that they have to have a malleability to them in order to serve us. There has to be like a flow, a fluidity to the story because we are, our world is rapidly changing. We are in many ways relatively staying the same as human beings as far as like our desires, our needs, our wants. But that place between the internal life and the external life is where story rises up to help mediate that space. Mm-hmm. And so the stories have to change and yeah. bend. And and um, so I think maybe that's a little bit about how I mediate and disrupt stories. <laughs> uh, one part of my practice that relates to that, which I think is maybe the most interesting thing I do, is I take... What I say is I appropriate my own imagery. So I go into old paintings and I will pull out one symbol, which has a lot of embedded meaning for me, and then I recontextualize it. Mm. And because I think that's what we do in our own experiences. We yeah. are in every, in this place right now, I'm bringing every story that I've ever lived. And, but I'm different. And the iteration of that story is different, but it's still informing me. Yeah. And so I think it, it just, the, the, the process mirrors the way I live my life, whether, whether I'm trying to or not. Hmm. Where, where would you say you source these? So where, where, where are your stories sourced from? You know what, what I, I mean, I'm oh, sure boy. there's just so many intersections. I'll there, tell you, like, I know exactly where they're sourced from. Okay. But it's sort of... It's uh, it's sort of the only the the type of thing that only an artist could say. <laughs> That's okay. You're an artist. So you can say it. I there is a location. It is called the Stream of Stories. I believe this is a geographical location. If you know where it is, all you have to do is sit along the border, the edge, the the uh, the bay what's the word along the The bank shore bank thank thank you You dip your hand in to the stream and the stream of stories is the place where every story that's ever been written will be written is in the process of being written it all lives there in in liquid form Mm -hmm. and you just dip your hand and you just pull whatever story you need out all right i have i have I believe that. Yeah. I feel like it's, in some ways, I feel like it's the power of the imagination to, to make that attainable for me and to feel like this is a real place. The real place for me is southeastern Oklahoma. I grew up on 400 acres that was a part of my family's original land allotment. So when my ancestors were removed from their homelands to Oklahoma, this is where my ancestors were were brought to. And that land stayed in the family and there's a limestone creek bed it's more than a creek but that ran through the the um property and as a child i would just i mean i would sit along that Mm. that bank and i would i mean for hours and i would watch the i would watch it change from day to day the flow of the water and i think that it's very hard to get away from our beginnings yeah and that place really formed me Mm. Can you say, you know, you're you're an artist and um, you're also a person of faith. Mm-hmm. Can you just share a little bit about, I mean, that intersection and also with not just the intersection of art and faith, but also growing up as um, a Native American in, in, in this land. Yeah. Like so many different competing, maybe not competing is the right word, no, but. That could be a good, yeah, good compete- descriptor. Yeah, if you can just unpack a little bit about that for us, yeah. that would be... Yeah, that's great. Great question. A big part of my life also is, yeah, this kind of inherent sense of what the way that I refer to is just always feeling like I was living in some kind of tension between one thing and another. So my Native American heritage, but also uh, being a follower of Jesus, there always felt like so much tension there just because of Indigenous communities' history with... Um, missionary work and and um, that would be attention um, being 
an artist and being told that you can't be an artist and also embody your faith or that there's not like a real place for you, a real professional place for you in the Mm -hmm. world. Um, I think that there's that I think all of our lives are filled with any number of tensions. And so I also feel like maybe in Western thought, we Western thought can somehow even further separate those tensions into either or thinking Mm -hmm. to, to a dualistic way of seeing the world. And I don't, I really think that that's a, that's a false um, way of living that really everything is very interrelated. So the tension has always been there. My approach to the tension, my understanding of the tension has changed greatly over my life. And I, where I maybe would feel a lot of frustration, a lot of angst, a lot of pain, over that tension, as I have grown into it, what I have realized is that the tension is the place that I'm supposed to live. Mm-hmm. And that, in fact, it really is the reality for for all of us. We do hold opposing things and we have the capacity to do that. And that there's actually a lot of really rich kind of information if we if we will do that rather than trying to live segmented in either either one place or the other. Yeah. And in that in that regard, I think my those those kind of like the fact pattern in my life has been a real gift to me because it has it has forced me to to understand how to hold things at the same time. And but it has been a real a real distinctive part of my process and a and a real like a real place of wrestling. Hmm. One thing I found really interesting about your art is that it does kind of speak to this interrelated you know, sometimes when we think about uh, a Christian, a person of faith engaging in in visual art, you know, there are certain kind of premeditated boxes that it's like, well, this, you know, if you're a Christian who's an artist, like, this, you know, then you you must do religious iconography, right? Like, and that's it. Yeah. Like, here's your lane, stay in your lane. And I see very much in your work this kind of this, again this resistance of this tension because you don't see a dichotomy. Yeah. There, like, you do see this interrelated component. Can you speak a little bit more to kind of the the spirituality of your work mm-hmm. and how and how that can, you know, because, again, so many people are would say, you know, I, I don't know, you know, I think art's beautiful. I don't know if I could that could go in a church or yeah. speak if you can just uh, maybe address that and in, in however way you, you want to address that. Yeah. Well, I, I think from the very first painting that I ever painted, which is titled Sing Like a Good Bird um, and it, I, I honestly don't, I can't necessarily tell you how this happened, but my art practice has always been this place for me to help form me spiritually. Mm-hmm. It feels like from the very beginning. So that first painting um, was of a bird that was in sort of like, it looked like a structure of a church. And and it was called Sing Like a, a Good Bird. And it was sort of like the, the caged bird sing, sings what it's told to sing. And it, it became a series of paintings. And in the course of that series of paintings, my mom told me that she watched me personally paint myself out of that cage and into a new story. Mm. And I think her articulating that, and all it, it resonated with me. And I, it, like in the beginning of my practice, I started to feel like I can... I can like create into something. Yeah. And I tell my students this, when you're creating, you can create a, create out of what you know. And it becomes like you're infusing the work with the things that you have learned and that you understand and that you, the places you've been spiritually, but you can also create into what you want to know. Mm. And it becomes this embodied practice of like, um, you're, you're creating like a piece of work, but you're also creating a spiritual reality. And it's very mysterious. Yeah. to me, even t- to this day, but it's also like such a tremendous gift to me mm. because I think that art is, the studio is the place that God forms me more yeah. than any any place. And it's a very, very sacred place. And I am always bringing what I bring to the work. And then I'm always receiving something that I couldn't have anticipated that really deepens me spiritually and surprises me and it like doesn't stop. Do you get a sense when you're in that kind of, and you're, when you're in the thick of the creative process that, that 
do you just feel like the presence of God and the and like does this you know I, I'm I come, I'm coming at this as a as a pastor so yeah. regularly preaching mm-hmm. and also as a musician and you know leading uh, musical worship before folks and you know I'm you know as when I'm in in that element like I am it, it really feels like an, an offering of worship and yeah. I'm, I'm wondering if you if you feel similarly do you feel like when you're creating this is an act of worship oh absolutely absolutely it's like I mean, I might not use that phrase, but it does feel like um, this. It's there's always been something that's been important to me about this idea about the movement of the gift, and the offering of the gift is like my primary act of obedience. You know, mm-hmm. it's it's because it can be difficult. You you there's really people don't really understand all that goes into the the process and yeah. all that you're pouring into it and the ways that you are wrestling and crying and you know we suffer for our art but um but the saying yes and the offering of the gift is there there i think there's a special for any of us when we're doing that when we're in that place in our specific gifting there is a special grace that that kind of accompanies that so it doesn't always feel like that sometimes it's like why can't i get that color right or what's wrong with this but it, it there is a lot of one of the things that i feel most it's just gratitude. Hmm. I sometimes I just cannot believe that I get to do this. Yeah, most times, most days, and some days are yeah. very different days. <laughs> <laughs> so let's. Uh, you mentioned process, and so I want to turn to some just kind of what, what I think are fun, fun nut, nuts and yeah. bolts questions. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's as I think some of our folks will be interested in, especially creators who are watching. Uh, if you can just tell us a, a little bit, what what is your process like uh, from conception to completion? Um, like, and I'm these are just questions that I'm coming in with. Like, yeah, do you come in with an idea, like, or is it an idea that you lead with? Is it materials that you lead with? Colors, stories, like what? Tell us a little bit about that process yeah. for you. Well, I think that one of the ways that I move about in the world is with a lot of curiosity and a lot of questions. Typically, things start with a question for me. Um, and what I have found is over the years is that the question is usually not a rhetorical question, but it's like a question I'm actually supposed to push into and, and try in some ways to not to resolve, but to engage. And so like right now I have a, a traveling exhibit called Altars of Re- Reconciliation. It's about the tension of being Native American and following the ways of Jesus. And the question that was posed at the beginning was, why would you believe in the faith of the colonizer, the invader? Mm -hmm. Some would say the white man. Um, That was the question. And so uh, I realized that's not a rhetorical question for me. And so pushing into that question and saying, like, why do I believe this? And articulating it, even though I had answers to that. Um, but articulating it even on a deeper level, oh my gosh, that question, it, it like, it, it changed my life, hmm. what I got in the process of asking that question. So, I mean, it starts with a question. I'm a, I'm a big researcher. Um, I'm just really curious about things. So I wanted, like, let's just take that body of work also as an example. I wanted to understand what other people had said about this. I wanted, his, like, uh, you know, historical documents that were I just I had a whole reading list I have a visual bibliography for every body of work I do because I read a Mm -hmm. ton and so that becomes an important part of the process and then out of that I'm looking for redundancy and which I think is probably what people do when they research I don't know Um, so things that are just sort of surfacing in, in the same ways and then I may have like one image or one idea and I just I feel like if I can start, then I don't ever have the whole thing figured out. Mm-hmm. I don't. A lot of times, I really have no clue what I'm doing. But if I just get in the process, and this is my process, I mean, there's a a jillion ways to be an artist, yeah. and there's a there's a lot of ways you got a lot you have a lot of choices. But for me, I want to make room for the Holy Spirit. So if I if I if I exert too much control too soon, then it's essentially all me, mm-hmm. and I want to make room for what the process wants to give me. And um, it, so I, it, oftentimes also, I don't exactly know what I've done until well after 
it's very hard to give an artist talk like at the fresh the end of a <laughs> I've done it before and it's like a little bit miserable but in like six months 12 months I'm like oh I can talk about this in a different yeah. way because I understand it hmm. do you kind of throw yourself into it or are you like do you work on things methodically and incrementally what's what's that kind of what's your guess <laughs> Just um, kidding, just kidding. I got two speeds. Okay, well, do you? I, I thought she only had one. Two. So. <laughs> but I do I do have an off switch. You but mean, you got 225 vibes, miles but. per hour or <laughs> three miles per hour. Yeah, so I think that it, there is a there is a something that, that compels me that feels very much outside of myself. And I would say that's God. That's yeah. answering, saying yes. That's the movement of the gift, all of those things. So when I'm in process, it's it can it, I do have some intensity mm-hmm. to my personality and some passion. And um, when I'm in the process, I'm it's it's can be all or nothing. But there's a cycle to the creative process. I don't think that you can sustain long term that that intensity of like production. Mm-hmm. And that's where the questions and the 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 thinking and the writing and the research is plays actually a really important part for me yeah. because it's in some ways it's rest, even yeah. though it might not look like rest. And yeah, then you get into the studio and it's like, Phew. yeah, but it balances out to that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one thing I love about uh, your, your pieces is, is your use of color. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's so vibrant mm-hmm. and um, I would say even like whimsical yeah. at, at times. And, um, just tell us a little bit about what's behind that for you. Color? I think it's like if you're going to be a painter. Just go all out? Yeah, I mean, I don't know. It's interesting because when I uh, – there was a period of time in my life where I would do these very large black and white drawings with, like, black ink. And they mm-hmm. were tedious and um, only black and white. And I, I would have, like, people all the time be like, oh, man, if you added color to this, this would just be, like, incredible. And I can remember – being like, I don't want to use color. How dare you? Um, <laughs> which I think is so interesting because it, it really is a hallmark of my work. The use of yeah. color is very, very whimsical, very dynamic, very like. It's in your face. No, it's in your face. Nothing subtle about it. Yeah. <laughs> and I, but I do think like as an artist, there's there are layers that you're working within. There's multiple, you know, layers of meanings. And color is something that that does engage a person. Almost anybody can engage with my work on that, on that um, level, you know, and that's helpful because I'm going like really deep also. And there's a lot of, a lot of ways that people will never engage and never know what, what it is I'm like digging into. And that's okay. You know, at some point you just have to let go of that. Yeah. Yeah. A couple more uh, questions for you. This one directly relates to some of our, our focus is our, our FOSA at the at the center, and so one of our one of our key programmatic emphases at the Center for Worship and the Arts is a focus on empowering teenagers, mm-hmm. in particular, to live into their full mm-hmm. artistic mm-hmm. callings, whatever whatever artistry they are called to. Mm-hmm. And so, for you, I'm curious to know what what would you say to an aspiring visual artist? Well, maybe not inspiring. I think they're they are visual artists, mm-hmm. teenagers who are visual artists who want to use their creativity to glorify God. Yeah, I mean there's so many things that I would say and I do say. But one thing is to develop your your inner life. Um, which I think is really, really hard for anybody. But I would especially say that it's difficult for this young generation because there's so much coming at us all the time. Mm-hmm. And we're inundated with people's opinions and the way things should be and the ideas and, you know, marketing and all of mm-hmm. it constantly. And, and if you're going to be an artist that has anything to say in the world, you're going to have to learn how to shut that out. Yeah. And you're going to have to learn how to go inside and be still. And in that place, I think there's a lot of things that happen. God is speaking. I mean, God is always speaking. Yeah. Um, but you're also doing the work of understanding who you are and what your voice is and what your gift is supposed to be in the world. And that is really, really deep, valuable work that I don't know. I start to wonder, you know, what's that going to look like? 
in, yeah. in the, this generation because, and just saying yes to that. I mean, to who you are and who you were made to be in the world. Like this one thing I'm very passionate about is just empowering people to be like the unique expression that you're, you're meant to be. Hmm. So I would say that. Okay. But there could be other answers also. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, do you find, is that something that's, you know, in your professional work at, at John Brown and, you know, cause you're working with students who are just emerging from their teenage years and into young adulthood. Um, is that a process you encourage as a part of their kind of undergraduate program? Oh, yeah. Is to know thyself, essentially? Yeah. I mean, I have one course that I I frame, and it's a year-long course. There's a part one and a part two, and I frame it with the, qu- the, the framework that we are using to build this semester is, who are you? <laughs> and, yeah. and sometimes I get pushback because it's like, I don't know. But, you know, I, I say this a lot, like, your life is always showing up as your teacher. And we, if we really are paying attention, we really do know a lot more than, than we think we do. It's just that sometimes we take on um, this, there's things that are imposed upon us from outside, culturally, family, the expectations, ideas, that um, beca- make it really difficult to, to sort of tune in to the, the, really the one voice that matters. But yeah, I mean that, they, whew, they love it, but they and it's so fruitful. Um, yeah. But they also were like, some of them have existential crisis. But I mean, you know, yeah. it's it's going to happen sooner or later. So right. Might yeah. as well be under my care. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, another question about um, so we work a lot with churches at, at the center and um, a lot of commu- churches and community partners and. Uh, when we're chatting with folks, there are always churches who are looking for ways to incorporate visual arts in their in their community. Mm-hmm. Uh, they don't know where to start, yeah. uh, you know. And you know, just as a, a baseline, what would you what would you suggest for these communities? They they you know they want this. They want art, mm-hmm. visual art, support art in some kind of way. Yeah. In the context of of their worshiping community, like where do they even start? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think there's probably a lot of better answers than what I'm going to give you. But um, one thing that I feel like is it's likely that there is there are creative people in that congregation. And identifying who those people are and asking them, what do you need? How can I serve you? How can I come alongside you? There's And, and also I think in some ways not feeling like and not imposing on them that their gift has to serve the congregation in some like kind of overused way. Mm -hmm. Um, There is a, there is some literature out there that talks about how an artist is, is a, is a border stalker, somebody that is, has the capacity to move in and out of communities. I know that I've experienced this in my own life. So my faith community has always been really, really important to me, but in a lot of cases, I have felt more dissonance within those communities than I have anywhere else in the world. Mm -hmm. And so there's people that talk about border stalkers that as they move out of that safe place into other communities, um, that it can be a real vulnerable place and that they really need a place where they can feel seen and supported and loved and taken care of. And it's like, how can you care for the artists that are in your, in your congregation? And, I think some of that's going to be specific to the people yeah, and not trying to take like use their gift for some like utilitarian like service. A prop. Yeah. Kinda, you know. Yeah. And I think talking about art from the front, I mean, it could be as easy as like, if you're an artist in our congregation, we want to take a minute and pray for you. Yeah. You know, just, I think, there being some sort of like forward facing conversation that's that begins to talk about that it instills value. And I mean, I think with artists, it takes so little because artists are really used to being very undervalued. Mm-hmm. And um, there are I, I think it takes very, very little to to create a space where it's like, oh, this is different. Somebody sees me. Somebody understands this is a gift and that there's actual real power behind that. Um, can be transformative for a person. Yeah, it sounds like you know cultivating those relationships is really that 
that first that first big step. I think because, so. Because I'm thinking about you know d- running a comparison between you know music is o- is often used as the only art form, right? In and aside from like spoken word through through the act of preaching, yeah. Um, and you know musicians have been conditioned to to play every single week, you know, in some kind of capacity right. for the church. Mm-hmm. And I feel like, and feel free to push back on this, I feel like that rhythm would not be sustainable for visual artists. Like, hey, we need you to produce something every single week mm-hmm. for us as a, to enrich our worship experience. Yeah. Well, I think it's a difference. That's the difference between what we would talk about as liturgical art and um, an artist that is, if, you know, following Jesus that's, I don't know. Um, you know, I think the liturgical art it does have a different emphasis. It is serving the message. It is serving the congregation and there's real specificity to it and maybe more confines. And I think it's a different thing yeah, altogether. And it's, this is actually something that I feel like is very misunderstood. I, I was just going to point that out. I was like, I feel like yeah. this distinction is not even widely known. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, yes, I could, I could kind of go off on it, uh, go on about it. But I think, you know, there's, there's one thing is like churches have space. Yeah. And man, artists need space. It would be so easy. And I have had, I had a, probably the most incredible studio of my life was just gifted to me by a congregation that I wasn't even a part of. They just saw the the yeah. gift in me. And, and um, I mean, tons of square footage and uh, a church in Oklahoma City, City Press. And uh, my studio space was there for probably three years. And I mean, mm-hmm. space is something that is, a huge commodity for an artist and kind yeah. of like churches have a lot of space they don't use. Low hanging fruit for churches. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, you want to make a difference. And the thing is, is that I feel like you do that with one artist and then people start to talk about it and they're mm-hmm. like, well, that's interesting. That's a cool totally arrangement right. I mean, you have. You, yeah. you, can have a, you can have a whole like flourishing thing before you knew it. Yeah. Wow. Well, take note. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, just to, to wrap up our, our time together, just to, uh, uh, and feel free to answer this however you'd like to, you know, what's next for you and, you know, and, or what's, what's, what's down the pipeline? I don't know if that's an anxiety inducing question or not, but, um, it's not, I'm just okay. wondering when will this air? That, um, <laughs> that's a great question. Um, uh, listener, we're in, we're in April now in Holy Week, um, probably in the next, I would guess the next month or so, probably okay. by by May or June. Super, super exciting things going on. So I will be I'm a, I'm will be leaving John Brown. Okay. I've been there five years. It's been a such a gift, such a beautiful time in my life. If you have young people that are artists that love Jesus, send them to JBU. All right. It's a or Sanford. Sanford. <laughs> As a backup, so JBU. so JBU <laughs> art department is the largest art major, the largest campus uh, major on campus. It's really, really, really unusual. Wow! And I am heading into a fully funded three year fellowship to work on um, my art practice, but also with a cohort. It's really unusual a cohort of people in Oklahoma City that um, are working outside of any kind of institutional structure to make OKC a place of flourishing for everyone. And Mm -hmm. um, they have basically said, we believe if we create space for you, the gift that God has put inside of you is going to flourish. It's going to, it's going to come out. And we, we just trust that. So I'm, you know, shocked. Amazing. And so excited. Yeah. Um, There's going to be a lot of loss and sadness in leaving, but um, it's also going to be interesting to see how that, I mean, you heard it here first. Yeah. All right. I mean, yeah. Where can we? Um, where can we keep? Uh, where can we keep tabs on you? Aaron? Okay, keep tabs on me. I want you to keep tabs on me. I like friends. Um, AaronShawArt dot com is my website. It has all of my social media stuff on there, but um, in all the places: Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Flying to Oklahoma. Flying to Oklahoma. You can come see me. Yes, yeah. I love. I love people. Gosh, what a great gift that's been. It's because it's genuine, you know. Yeah. Um, so, yes, come see me. All right. Absolutely. You heard it here. <laughs>
Well, thank you again, Aaron, just for spending some time with us um, all day today, yeah. actually, at, at, at Sanford and most of the day tomorrow yeah. and, and time spent here. And so uh, we're just grateful for um, all that you offer. And um, thank you all for, for watching. And we'll see you in the next Green Room interview. Thanks.